Thomas, thank you very much for making the time to, to speak to me. Uh, you wrote an article that was incredibly well researched. I think it was about 39 pages in total uh, that has been very, very popular. I think it's been shared over 24 million times now in the last few days. Would you just be able to sort of summarize what do you think is the main takeaway from that article that people need to know? Yes, sure. The number of cases of coronavirus is exploding globally. People don't realize that's happening because this is exponential, uh, which means that at the beginning it's very slow and suddenly it explodes. Um, that is why most countries have not taken the measures that they needed to take. The moment to take the measures, it's when it's here. It's not when it's here. Uh, at that point, uh, the outbreak has already exploded. So what you need, uh, so the goal of the, of the article was to um, explain what's gonna happen, um, which is if you don't do anything, the cases are gonna explode. Once they explode, they're going to overrun the healthcare system. Once they do, the mortality rate of uh, the coronavirus will explode, um, probably up to 10x, 10 times uh, higher mortality, plus all the other com comorbidities, meaning that if you have a heart attack, but the ICU is uh, collapsed, you're going to die. Um, and so what are we to do against, uh, to, do, to um, prevent that from happening? Uh, reduce our social contact as much as possible. It's called social distancing. Um, so that instead of having a huge spike, uh, a huge peak, we little by little increase this illness so that A, we don't overrun the healthcare system and B, as many people as possible can have it not today, but in a year or in a year and a half when there's going to be a vaccine. Thomas, can I ask your your background, because I understand you're not in the media, you're not a journalist. How long yeah. did it take you to write and what's your background for, for doing this? So I had spent, before I wrote it, I had spent around two weeks uh, researching this around four, four to five hours a day. Um, and I think uh, your underlying question is, why should people listen to me? Um, and I think the answer is they shouldn't. They shouldn't listen to me. Uh, I, I am not an epidemiologist. I am not a biologist. What I've done is gather all the research from all of these different places and put it in one place so that people can understand it. Um, you should judge the article based on the data and the arguments and the sources, not on the fact that it's me. It so happens that um, I have a couple of uh, um, background um, elements that have helped me put this together. Uh, I'm an engineer. I have two masters of science, so I'm very, very close to all things uh, data and analysis and statistics. I worked as a consultant where I had to get into companies and understand them within two to three weeks. So I'm very, uh, I have experience uh, 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 going deep into understanding a problem very, very quickly. I also created some viral applications that uh, exploded to up to 20 million users. So I am acquainted with the analytics of virality. Um, so I think these are some of the reasons why I was able to put these two together, but people don't, shouldn't see me as uh, the person making the arguments, but rather making the assembly of the arguments. And so we talk a lot on, on this channel. We look very closely at sense making what are the failures in sense making and especially about how do we get better? How do we up regulate our discernment and our sense making? And it's really interesting that you seem to be doing something that so far the mainstream media hasn't done to that level. Why do you think that is? Well, the, the, the media and, the, and, uh, and politicians, um, and, and, and I care about both, but I care more about politicians. Um, I think, I think one of the key uh, mental frameworks that most people are lack is exponential growth. Um, the, the, in my job, I didn't mention that, but in, but in my job, both in the viral applications, but, but in tech in general, uh, you, you're going for exponential growth and you understand the, the mechanics of exponential growth. So when you see that something is growing at 20% or 30% day over day, you freak out. Uh, either you're super happy if it's your product or you're super, super, super scared if it's a virus. 
uh, but because you understand what's going to happen in a week, two weeks, three weeks, three months, four months. Um, so I think that's what that's one of the key issues uh, why people didn't understand what was going to happen. Um, th th there's also uh, uh, an issue of um, connecting the dots here because it's not just one uh, part. Uh, this, this is a puzzle and, and you need to put it together. And most uh, uh, journalists, especially when they're covering news, they are not trained to put all the pieces together. I mean, this is, you, you need to put the pieces together of, hey, this is not China anymore, it's these other countries. Hey, it's gonna be growing exponentially. Hey, the only way to stop this is with social distancing and so on and so forth. Um, uh, so a lot of journalists do that really well, but it's these are usually in like research pieces that take months, not, not in the news cycle. Um, that's my guess, I have no idea here. Um, I think on the politician side, uh, uh, my guess is, and again, this is a guess, um, they, um, th they are making decisions with an unclear understanding of what the objective is and what the cost benefits are. Um, and I'll give you an example. <clears throat> Right now, you have a country that just, uh, France, that just said that they're going to be uh, doing heavy social distancing. And you have another one, the UK, which is saying that, they, that we're, they're going to have herd immunity. You know? it sounds crazy that two countries that are so close to each other geographically and are only apart in a few days in the number of cases have a drastically different uh, decision-making process, right? Uh, uh, and my guess is, by, by hearing different people in, in these different countries, is that um, they're not talking apples to apples. Um, uh, in the British government, they're saying, oh, it's too expensive, it's too hard to, make, to do social distancing, so let's just run this thing. Slow it down a little bit, but run this. Uh, the French are saying, oh, and we're realizing now this is bad, let's, let's slow this down as much as possible. But really, the question that both of these should be asking is, uh, what is our objective? Uh, uh, do we want to minimize deaths? Do we want to minimize the ROI of eight years lived uh, versus cost of year lived? Um, and, then, and then what are the measures that have the highest uh, cost benefit? So for example, uh, for, um, it might be that doing a lockdown right now for two weeks and then uh, slowly releasing uh, social distancing measures has the optimal ROI because it gets your curve, it sl uh, stops your curve, starts going down. And once you are, uh, uh, you're going down, you can slowly release uh, social distancing measures so that it's controlled, right? Um, but for, for you to make that decision of whether you, you wanna do this or like in the UK, this, right? Um, you need to understand what's the cost of um, uh, uh, what's the benefit that each one of these measures is going to get you versus what's the cost? Uh, for, for example, maybe uh, eliminating all sports uh, gives you a reduction of 10% in the transmission rate. And that's what you want. You want to reduce the transmission rate by 60%. Okay, so I'm going to stop sports because the cost is low. And then maybe I'm stopping gatherings of 100 people or more because that's super spreading and, and the cost is low and so on and so forth. And you start taking the measures that are the lowest cost and the highest benefit, and you and you and you add them up to get to the uh, to the right ROI. Um, I I uh, I've been looking online for anything like this, and I've not seen anybody mention anything like this. So the fear is that they're making a, a decision based on incomplete data and based on the wrong uh, mental uh, frameworks, uh, and that's why it's so haphazard. And every country is making different decisions. And. There, there's a lot of concern as well about the second order and third order effects of these kind of measures. Is there not a concern that by implementing really, really strict social distancing, really, really strict restrictions now, that that will, could cascade into major, like major economic failure and, and some, some effects that are, that are potentially even worse than the, the outbreak? Absolutely. And so, and so I think that's what should be uh, baked into that cost benefit, um, and so, uh, uh, but but that cost benefit doesn't exist. So they're making the, those decisions intuitively. Um, he, here are a couple of of thoughts that I think can 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 help us make these kind of decisions. Um, you have the good example of Wuhan uh, or the entire Hubei region, uh, where they were extremely extremely aggressive. Um, 
that and, and they can understand from there what were their second and third order uh, uh, problems. And there were many people were locked home and died because of that, right? <clears throat> uh, but then you can see uh, something like Italy, which is not too far away, but much better, I think, uh, uh, because the hardest costs are things like, I can go to the hospital, I can go to the groceries, you know? Uh, um, I can just leave home. Um, if I abs for example, if I absolutely have to go to work, otherwise I'm gonna lose my job, then yeah, you should go, be able to go to work. Right, so it's not this uh, binary thing. Uh, you can keep. Uh, it, it's more of of the, all the rainbow of options of social distancing. Which ones are the ones that have the highest cost benefit? Right, then you stack rank them and you go all like you. You say approved, or approved. Yes, 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 yes. No, 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 no. This is the threshold based on the optimal ROI. And are you concerned because it seems from from here we're based in London that the US given that you have a kind of very individualist attitude to healthcare, you don't really have a national health service, you've got very low safety nets compared to Europe, so people maybe who are sick will be more encouraged to go into work because they're, they're closer to, they don't have sick pay, they don't have medical insurance. Are you concerned that the US might be more fragile than, than other places? <coughs> I, I, I think there's pros and cons in each country. Um, uh, and I'm closer to, you, to the US and then to Spain and France so, so I can compare Europe with the US that way. Um, like first, yes, there, there's no federal sick leave. Uh, many people don't have uh, insurance so they, they can't access the healthcare system. Um, as a result, a lot of people will just not be able to stop working uh, and will not be able to go to the healthcare system. Right? So, so, so these are some of the big issues. There's many more. Um, uh, uh, another one is, is the healthcare system being completely privatized, uh, cannot be uh, easily coordinated uh, at a national level. France, for example, is just showing the immense um, uh, benefits of that coordination. Within uh, 24 hours, they were able to, to, uh, to get the country uh, prepared for this. Um, the US has a few other things that are going for, for them. First is the density. It is a very low density country compared to uh, most other countries uh, uh, in Europe, most countries in Europe. Um, and, and that's great for a lower transmission uh, level. Public transport is very bad, which is great in this circumstance. Uh, most people take their cars, so that reduces the transmission in, in public transport. Um, uh, remote work, I think, is relatively uh, developed for white collar uh, workers, so I think that can help. Uh, and as a rule of thumb, they're a bit more individualistic. So, so, so the social transmission is probably going to be lower. Finally, the healthcare system, uh, the, the good thing about being decentralized is that you have a lot of different approaches to this. And, and uh, the, uh, the ones that are not as good can quickly learn from the ones that are good. We're seeing a lot of systemic fragilities in various different areas. And one of them is the ability to make sense of the crisis. And I think one of the things that's required is for people to to improve their discernment, to step up, and potentially alternatives to some of the failing systems are emerging. And I would put you in that bracket as someone who seems to be making sense of the outbreak better than most, if not all, in the mainstream media. Do you sense that, that people are having to step up? Um, so first on, on, on my case, I think this was just, like there was a lot of luck here uh, involved. Uh, a lot of people were putting a lot of things together and mine happened to resonate. Uh, but I'm sure there's other pieces that, that are at least as good, if not better. Uh, um, but mine just happened to, to, to catch on, and, and, and this is where we are. I, I think uh, he here we are in a perfect example of new information coming to society. Uh, it reminds me of, for example, what happened with, uh, with Brexit or, or the Trump election in 2016, where um, it, it, it took everybody aback uh, nobody knew how to interpret that uh, situation, right? Uh, and so suddenly there's this new information in the system and, 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 and the system just doesn't know how to uh, cope with it. Uh, and so it tries to dig digest it. So the question becomes, when you have these, uh, this doesn't happen frequently, by the way, but, but, but when it happens, what is the best process to, uh, um, uh, to, to process this information as quickly as possible? And I would say what is, uh, happening today is the right way to do it. Um, 
in, in, if, if you think about it, two weeks ago in, in the West, nobody was thinking this is a problem. And then within two weeks, uh, everybody now realizes the problem. Right? And, and I might have contributed a little bit to the conversation. Many others have a, 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 lot, more, a lot more than, than I have. But this distribution uh, of, of the thoughts process through Twitter, through Facebook, through uh, all social media uh, makes, uh, gives a huge ability for our um, open societies to react. Now, this is just one, this is just one way that um, societies can react. I think that's the Western world. The other approach obviously is the Chinese uh, approach, right? And, and, and I think there, there's two differences uh, to make. One of them is uh, what happened at the beginning of the crisis in China and then what happened afterwards. Uh, they didn't catch it properly. They didn't catch it properly, not because people didn't uh, uh, alert the system, uh, but because the system does not uh, allow for free speech. They had people saying, hey, there's a problem here, there's a problem here, and these people were going to prison. Um, until, until then, they realized that, that the, uh, the problem was big, and then they reacted properly. So I think uh, uh, what that uh, illustrates is the fact that for understanding the problems and for um, deciding to react to them, uh, societies with free, free speech are going to always be substantially stronger. Um, for decisions, quick and swift decisions uh, um, on, on what to do about it, then it really depends. Uh, you, you, you do have a dictatorship or, or, or a, a very strong uh, government, uh, authoritarian government in China who was able to, uh, to react very quickly. But Singapore and Taiwan were also able to react very quickly. So I, I don't buy the argument that uh, authoritarian regimes can uh, react more quickly. I think there's a vast uh, component of education and culture that, uh, that, that is very important here. We can do better than this. Uh, we and, and and Taiwan and, and Singapore are and even Japan and Korea are good examples of that. Can you recommend anyone any good resources for information for people to follow? Sort of either people on Twitter or communities that you think are doing good sense making around this. Yeah. So so I think a few um, world of meters is great for live uh, update on the coronavirus data. Uh, then uh, there's a GitHub repository for raw data on cases, deaths, and things like that. It's on my Medium post, uh, the full link. Um, and I like going to the raw data because, uh, uneditorialized, because otherwise it's very hard to, to tell what's right and what's wrong. The second type of uh, source is scientific papers. Uh, um, and in pages like MedX, for example, you can find a lot of them. There's, I think, around 100 papers that have been published just this week on coronavirus, uh, and, and it's growing very, very fast. Uh, many of them have not been peer reviewed, but, but the, the point of, the reason why uh, scientific papers are super useful uh, is because they are the best thought through uh, a package around a single idea. And so you can then uh, 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 take those and in, incorporate them as you get more information incorporate, incorporate into your thinking. And then there's a few, uh, so I think that's, the, that, that's the, the core layer. The core layer is the, the raw data and we always need to go back to that. Um, and then there's the, uh, the, the creators on top of it. Um, and, and, and there's, uh, I think that, that there's, there's millions that are super useful there. Uh, um, I think for me, um, I'm, I'm looking right now, uh, a couple of them that were useful. So, um, uh, Dr. I think uh, her name is Muje Civic. It's at M U G E C E V I K. Um, she's a virology clinician and researcher. Are these um, links in your article, or are you able to share them with me after the call and we can put them into the show notes? Maybe. Sounds good. I'll do that. I'll do that. Let, let, let's do that and then I can put them into the show notes for people. Sounds good. Um, just a couple of questions. Did you listen to the recent Sam Harris podcast with the, with the person from Johns Hopkins? No, I haven't. This, this was one of the uh, epidemiologists at Johns Hopkins who was in charge of the 
uh, infectious diseases and was tasked with kind of being aware of these outbreaks, they were convinced that the death rate was going to be maximum 0.6%, whereas your article seems to be sort of pointing at a much higher death rate than that. I, I pointed a range that goes from actually 0 0.6 to 4. Um, <clears throat> and I think there's two, two, two things to, to discuss about that. Uh, the, the, the key one is the mortality rate is not a thing that is only dependent on the virus. Um, there are many, many factors that determine the death rate, the average death rate. Um, one of them is just the, the age of the population, right? We know that uh, the, at least in China, the death rate for people 80 and above is 15%, and people uh, much younger, uh, 40 and below, I think is 0 to 2 on average, right? So if you have a very old population like Japan, your mortality rate is going to be substantially higher than in Nigeria. Um, so that's one of the factors. Um, Another factor is your denominator, right? How many uh, diagnostics you have? Because if you, because uh, it's very likely that you're going to catch the deaths. Somebody da dies because of this, you're probably going to do a test, and it's going to it's going to be positive. Uh, but when somebody just has a cough, um, and you don't test that that person, they might have the coronavirus. You don't you don't know, right? So the countries that test more are going to have a lower uh, mortality rate, fatality rate because of that, right? Um, so, so, um, and then a third factor is uh, healthcare system collapse. So, so for example, I think in I don't remember the actual num the specific numbers, but I think uh, in in the Hubei area, the the fatality rate is probably going to be close to four or five, something like that. Whereas outside of Hubei, is going to be close to close to zero nine, I think. Right? Um, why? Because uh, the system collapsed in Hubei and it didn't outside. So what every, all of this is saying is there's a very broad range of, um, uh, of fatality rates. And the question becomes, what is it going to be true for, for us? And so the, the, the first factor is, is, as I mentioned, right, um, um, test rates. And the US, for example, is, is, is very, very, very low. The UK is very, 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 very low. I think the UK is 10 times lower than, than, than South Korea on, as a per capita basis. And the, the, the US is even lower. Um, as of today, or as of a couple of days ago. Um, so that's one. Um, the, the other more important one is uh, our healthcare system. And that completely depends on our response. Um, so if we take it now and we slow it down, we will, we, and we control it like South Korea has, yes, it is, there's a very high chance that it's 0, 0.6%. If we don't, and the system collapses, it's much more likely that we're going to be like Hubei. So it's on us. It's not a thing. It's on us and how we react. And that's why I think it's so important to, to take measures now to reduce the mortality rate. And so the UK has, as you said before, taken a, a different angle. They're talking about herd immunity and managing the outbreak in a, in a different way to elsewhere. I'm guessing that you're quite skeptical of that as a strategy. So, uh, I'm, yes, but. So, uh, I think epidemiologists uh, are, are not great at communication, unfortunately. So, I, I don't want to put a straw man argument. Uh, I want to do the other way. The, the, I want to do a steel man argument, right? Uh, let's, let's try to understand really what they're trying to say and then why I think they're wrong. I think what they're saying is, look, this is very, very hard to contain. Uh, and so what we need to do is, is spread it over time as much as we can um, to, uh, um, to get uh, people little by little um, um, uh, infected and then immunized uh, so that at some point in the future, A, first, because it was little by little, the healthcare system doesn't, doesn't break. Uh, and B, over time, these people are now immune, so the transmission rate goes down, and then uh, this virus dies on itself, on its own. So I think uh, that argument is, is what I think they're making, and it's a reasonable one. Here are the flaws that I see with it. First is, they're not accounting for the, act, the fact that the vaccine is gonna come in a year to a year and a half, right? So in fact, if you can 
uh, slow down as much as possible this thing for up to a year, to a year and a half. In fact, a lot of people who would catch it uh, uh, will, will, uh, wouldn't catch it at all. Uh, and so they would survive, right? Um, I think that the, the first, that's the first thing. That the second thing that is crucial is that reasoning is valid, but it also means that you need to, make, uh, to take action now. Because if you don't take action now, you're going to have a massive peak and your argument of flattening the curve and spreading the cases over time is not going to be valid anymore. Uh, and, and that is, to me, the specific area where their, their, their uh, reasoning is flawed. If they're saying herd immunity slowly, then they need to make, take action right now. Not tomorrow, not on Monday. You need to make action right now. So are you suggesting that the, the social distancing will need to be in place for, an, until the vaccine arrives for a year, a year and a half? So, um, yes, but that, uh, said that like that, uh, it, it suggests that social distancing is, is a binary thing. It's, there, uh, it's, it's either there is social distancing or, or there's not. And that's not true. What we need to do is right now do a lot of social distancing to get this thing as low as possible, as fast as possible. And once that dies down, there's still going to be a few cases here and there. But then we can release the social distancing measures uh, slowly so that uh, the virus now starts spreading again, but slowly and in a controlled way. Um, so that our healthcare system can learn from it, can increase its capacity. Uh, and, and then we can play with these things. Uh, the, the more we understand them, the better, right? Uh, is there going to be no Premier League for a year? Well, um, if that's the biggest thing that uh, contributes to, uh, to the viral spread, yeah, maybe. That's not so bad. It's bad for the, for the clubs, but it's not so bad for the rest of, the, of society, right? Um, should we all stop going to groceries right now? No, absolutely not. Schools, what about schools, right? So, so these are, but these are the decisions that need to be made. It's not social distancing, yes or no. It's out of the hundred things that contribute to, trans, to transmission, what are the ones that we should be uh, still doing today and the ones that we should stop? And what is, that, what is true today and how does that evolve over time? And what do you, what, what's the most likely trajectory of this from what you've seen uh, going forward, I guess it all depends on what it, what actions are taken now. But but what are you what are you seeing longer term? What are your fears, and what do you think is the best case? It depends completely on the country and and how each country reacts. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Let's let's do a worst case and then a best case. Worst case, a lot of these countries don't react, um, and then it's an epidemic everywhere. Um, the, the countries that um, want to be protected uh, will shut down their, um, their, their borders for a very long time. Uh, flights are not going to be available for a very long time uh, between these countries. Um, there's going to be heavy, heavy uh, social distancing measures in the countries that, um, that, that are taking this seriously. And that will last up till when we have a um, vaccine in one year, two year and a half. The, uh, that's the worst case scenario. The, the, the best case scenario is every country realizes very, very quickly, learning from each other, that this is very serious. And they all take social distancing measures right now. Um, therefore, lowering massively the, um, uh, the transmission rate today and lowering in the next, so that would mean that we would have a peak in cases in a couple of weeks, and then it would start uh, slowing down. So you do a, a heavy social distancing for four to six weeks. Uh, this thing goes down dramatically everywhere, and then you start across the world releasing the, um, the social distancing uh, measures. The, 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 there's one more thing I wanna add here is, uh, we've talked about social distancing, uh, um, but, Social distancing is, is one of the key uh, levers to affect transmission, but it's not the only one. So if you think about it, right, uh, how does transition, uh, this, transition, this uh, transmission rate work? It depends on how many people you meet every day and what percentage of those uh, meetings become a contagion. Right? Social distancing plays against the first factor. It reduces the number of people you meet 
it doesn't play as much in the contagion between people. So that's the second lever that we can massively be using uh, uh, over, the, over the next year. So for example, when people say, stop handshaking, that's not a, that, that, is, that can be considered in social distancing uh, uh, um, a factor, but it's not as much, I'm gonna meet fewer people. It's if I meet them, I'm, there's gonna be less contagion. Right? So things like, I'm gonna work uh, at least from a distance of a couple of meters from you. I'm not gonna shake your hands. I'm gonna be wearing masks. I'm going to um, learn not to touch my face. I'm going to learn to um, wash my hands uh, every 20 minutes and so on and so forth. All these measures are not as much social distancing, um, but they also dramatically reduce the transmission rate. Right? And these are actually not as expensive. So I think, uh, though, and it might very well be that you can reduce by half the transmission rate with this. And then this is not a dramatic epidemic anymore. Right? So, as a society over the next few weeks, we need to learn what are these levers to reduce the transmission rate. Some of them are gonna be social distancing, some of them reducing the contagion per, per encounter, uh, and, and together figure out the, the, the way to not collapse healthcare systems and, and, and optimize uh, both mortality rates and the economy. Great. Thank you very much, Thomas. And yeah, thank you for the work that you're putting in, uh, in trying to track this and make sense of it and for making the time to speak to me. Uh, I'm, I'm trying hard. Thank you. Thank you for uh, having me and listening to, to my thoughts.